Welcome to worship, Stonebridge. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. I want to take just a minute to tell you about reopening and attending church together live. We all want to do that. But I have to tell you something. We are entering into the hottest months of the year. And we have a fabulous reopening task force and elders on session who have been working at ways to bring us together. They have put together a map of our sanctuary so that we could get 50 people in the sanctuary wearing masks, no singing, socially distanced, probably the bathroom's not open, no gathering outside afterwards, everyone remaining at least six feet or further apart, no children's programming, no youth programming, but we could make that happen. The challenge is we would do it in our sanctuary where we have an enclosed space with air conditioning recirculating the air, which is what all the the, the, the uh, representatives, the health officials have said is a Petri dish for creating COVID. You know, there's a church that had 386 people attend a service and 256 of them got COVID. Churches are the number one place for spiking uh, COVID cases right now. And so what we're gonna do for July and August is stay online and we're going to introduce home worship groups. These are opportunities for 10 or fewer people to worship together, to watch the videos together and participate. Uh, Pastor Jonathan and I are going to talk about that. Uh, we have got an online uh, conversation we're scheduling. We would love for you to watch that on Facebook Live or get the link from the church website or we'll send it out to you in emails please take a, a, a little bit of time to listen to an extended conversation about all of this. It's important to the life of our church. But for now, let's worship God together. Welcome to Stonebridge Online. Feel free to pause the video during these announcements in order to grab all the information you may need. During this time of worshiping virtually, it's important to continue contributing to the ongoing ministry of Stonebridge, here are the ways in which you can give. You can give online through our website at stonebridgecme.com, click on online giving, through your bank's bill pay option, or by mail. If you'd like business reply offering envelopes sent to you, please contact the church office. In compliance with CDC recommendations and the most recent Ventura County Health Officers mandates, the Stonebridge Elder Board approved off-campus meeting guidelines. Take a look at the newsletter from this past week to find out all the details. Our first ever drive through communion was such a success a few weeks ago, we're going to do it again next month. This time, it'll be on a Saturday, July 11th at 5.30 p.m. This will also be a great opportunity to come wish Pastor Cynthia farewell before she moves to North Carolina to take on a position as campus chaplain at St. Andrews University. You can find more details in last week's newsletter. And finally, we'd love to know that you're participating in worship. Please continue to share your news, prayers, and praises by emailing prayers at stonebridgecme.com. Or if you're following along in YouVersion, please take the time to fill out the e-connection card. You are important to us. Once again, welcome to online worship. Hey, everybody. It's good to be with you again. Let's have a word of prayer together. Father God, thank you for this opportunity to sing praise to your name. Lord, you are worthy of so much more than we even have to give. Father, touch our hearts as we worship you. Fill us with your spirit and change us and renew us, God. In Jesus' name, amen.
perfect healer all my life, all my care. Your glory, God, is what I 
Hi, Stonebridge. Our scripture reading today comes from Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, They made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, Why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, to say to this paralyzed man, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up, take your mat, and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, Get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. Hello, Stonebridge. I have a question for you. Imagine you were thinking about a really important concern, something that you feel deeply that gets at who you are and your beliefs and maybe even impacts the rest of your life. Which of these two settings would you rather be in as you thought about that concern? Would you prefer to sit and listen to someone talk about it? Or would you like to sit with a good friend and talk about it together? Now imagine that that concern of yours um, is a pressing issue, something that you want to talk about really right away. But it turns out that that speaker has an agenda of their own, topics that they're going to talk about and might not get to yours for weeks or months. Or you could call a friend and say exactly what you wanted to talk about, and they would come with the intention of talking with you about that very specific concern. And then imagine that that place where that person speaks, uh, the people there have customs of their own that you're unfamiliar with. You've never been there. They sing songs you've never heard before. And the people there are just so friendly. They, they want to ask you to lunch and then come over to their house, you know, for another meeting. Uh, or you could sit at your favorite coffee place in your favorite corner with a friend and talk about your concern there. And then finally, imagine that uh, this place where the speaker talks is called a church. And we can maybe begin to imagine why churches are in decline. But funny thing is, a lot of Christians would be very comfortable to sit and listen in this setting week after week after week but would be pretty scared to be the listening and caring part of this situation. Not so our friends in the story that we're looking at today. In case you're listening to this sermon and it's been separated from, for some reason from the text that was just read, we're looking at Mark chapter 2 verses 1 to 12. We're in a sermon series on the gospel of Mark and we've gotten to chapter 2. It's a story of four friends who dig a hole in a roof and lower another friend down uh, into a room where Jesus is in the hopes that Jesus will heal him. 
uh, the man that they lower down is paralyzed, and when they lower him down, chaos and conflict ensue, but eventually Jesus does heal him physically and spiritually. Uh, in short, this is a powerful story of a community of faith reaching out to a neighbor with good news, the good news about Jesus in their town, that genuinely meets that neighbor's need in a way that has a profound impact on their life. So remember that back in chapter 1, uh, Jesus said this, The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Then for the rest of chapter 1, Jesus demonstrates that the kingdom has come near by uh, meeting people's needs. And then we jump to chapter 2, and chapter 2 begins with a home worship experience. Verse 2 says this, People gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and, and Jesus preached the word to them. Now, Mark doesn't tell us that this is a private home, but the same story is in the Gospel of Luke, and Luke does tell us that it's a home. So a community of friends shows up to this home uh, with one member of their community who really needs help, really needs to have a, a need met by Jesus. And we read in verse 4, Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat that the man was laying on. This is a story of friends bringing a friend to Jesus. And uh, that's great until the obstacles begin. Uh, first obstacle, they can't get in. They, they can't even get through the front door. No problem, we'll go up on the roof and see if there's a way in there. Obstacle two, there's no other way in. No problem, we'll just dig a hole in the roof and lower him down. Uh, and they tear open a large enough hole in the roof to get that man and his mat down on the floor right in front of Jesus. And this would be a bit unbelievable if we didn't know men. Because once men get an idea in their heads, oh, they can do some crazy things. Things like this, and this, 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 and even this. So, yeah men dug a hole in a roof and lowered their friend down. That happened. And then the biggest obstacle of all set in, an obstacle that the friends couldn't address, a problem they couldn't solve. It's the religious teachers, and they get involved. Mark 2, verses 5 and 6, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? The religious teachers had a problem with Jesus. And they start talking among themselves. Jesus tells the man, your sins are forgiven. And, and they say, uh, I, I don't think he's allowed to do that. He, he can't do that, right? So let's examine this picture more closely. There's a paralyzed man laying on the floor. There's dust in the air. There's roofing material still falling from the roof. The sun is shining in, and there's men looking down expectantly. And the people in the front area, oh, they're all pressing back. And the people in the back, they're all pressing forward to see what's going on. And the religious leaders are ignoring all of it. They aren't paying attention to anything any of it. They have religious things that take priority. They think they need to control the situation. We think they're misguided, but I, I just want you to know, that's what religious teachers do. I am one. I know. Some time ago, I was um, serving communion to 400 people in a big, large sanctuary that was round, that had uh, a ceiling that was 60 feet high, tile floors, uh, wooden pews everywhere. Well, I'll show you a picture of it. This is, this is it. And we had a 
big communion table with lots of brass trays uh, stacked up with each one with maybe 50 or more little shot glasses of juice uh, and then matching trays with cubed bread that had been cut carefully into neat little squares. And uh, all of them had lids on them, these stacks. Uh, and uh, the other pastor and I, wearing big robes with flowing sleeves and everything, we reached to take the lids off the trays and set them down, lids that were the size of hubcaps, uh, and set them on the table. And then we each picked up a stack of these serving um, trays with five or six stacked uh, of trays of drinks. And we turned to go to the servers who were about 20 feet away from us. But my robe, the, the sleeve on my robe, hit that lid, that hubcap sized lid, and knocked it on the floor. Well, you know what it did. It's brass, it's big, and it went wah, 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 wah. and it just kept going. And it was finally wah, 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 wah. It, 30, 40 seconds, it felt like. And um, so let me ask you a question. Did either I or the other pastor stop and look down or pick it up or acknowledge anything out of the ordinary was going on? Absolutely not. We just walked right up to those servers and uh, I could look at those servers and they looked at me and then they looked at that thing spinning behind me and they could not make eye contact without a big grin starting to come on their face. But me, I looked straight ahead. Now, one of the things that was worst about it was that after we served them, we went and sat down in these big old chairs we called thrones, and we had to look forward for about five minutes straight ahead at the whole congregation. But every once in a while, I'd look out of the corner of my eye and see that other pastor with a grin starting to show up on his face. Well, Carolyn was sitting in the back of the church and a, a man in front of her leaned over to his wife and said, what's going on? And his wife said, the big guy knocked something over. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, I will just ask you, um, was I thinking about the Holy Spirit moving through the congregation, through the precious sacrament of communion? Was I contemplating the sacrificial nature of Christ's death on the cross? No and no. I was thinking about how we could pad those brass lids. Well, I totally get the response of the religious teachers whose meeting had been interrupted. The man paralyzed on the floor, he's not in the bulletin. He's not on the program. Uh, but as they ignored the man on the floor and gave disapproving looks to the men uh, in, in the hole in the ceiling, and they whispered to each other about Jesus and what he was doing wrong, imagine the look of discomfort on the face of the paralyzed man or in the eyes of the men up above looking down on all of it. So I go back to these two settings, which would have been more conducive, more comfortable to the needs of the paralyzed man. So let me just jump in here now with that whole story behind us and take a look at a few points that we can get from this story. First, find a group because you're going to need it. Verse 3 says, Some men came, bringing to Jesus a paralyzed man carried by four of them. We don't know how many men were in the group, uh, but we know that four of them were carrying the paralyzed man. And somehow, uh, these men knew the paralyzed man well enough so that when they heard that Jesus was in town, they went and got him and said, Let's go. Let's get you healed by Jesus. They were part of a group. Maybe it was a formal group. Maybe they were just neighbors. The point for us is, we all need a group. We all need others. After my double knee replacement surgery in January, um, 
I was obviously in bed first and then on a couch and then sitting in a chair, but oh my gosh, my knees hurt all the time. And my legs had no uh, muscle strength whatsoever. If I was in a chair, there was no way I could scoot it, even on a tile floor. Now, about a month after I got home, uh, we had a birthday party for a family member and we had probably about 10 people and we sat down for dinner and I sat at the head of the table and everybody else filled in around me and they brought their conversations from the other room uh, and they, some of them passed water or poured things or passed things. And uh, I sat down and I was about a foot from the table. I couldn't move. Um, the floor was carpeted, not tiled. And I may as well have been 10 feet away because I couldn't scoot, I couldn't lean forward. Uh, and for just a moment, I felt forgotten. And then I got embarrassed because I couldn't do anything to help myself. And then Carolyn just leaned over. She says, what's, what's wrong? And I said, I, I can't move. And she and another person helped me and got me to the table and I rejoined the group. But it was an uncomfortable moment because I moved from the head of the table to the most needy person at the table in the blink of an eye. And I gotta tell you, blinks of the eye happen more often than we realize. In those moments, we need others. We need a group. When we read this story, if we picture ourselves in it, most of the time, I'm going to guess many of us, most of us imagine ourselves as one of those four who were uh, lowering their friend down. But we need to recognize we're also the paralyzed man. We are the one in need as well. We all have times in our lives when we need others. We need a group. And I'll be honest, I, I don't really care what kind of group it is for you. I mean, our growth groups are amazing. They're fabulous. And I, I would encourage every one of you to be in a growth group. But there's other kinds of groups. I have just recently gotten to know a group of men who have been playing board games together for 30 years. It, it's a board game group. But you know what? Those men would do whatever it they needed to to help somebody else in need in that group. They'd take somebody to Jesus if they needed to get there. As I say about the group of men in the story, we don't know how many are in the group and we don't know how many of them are married and how many of their wives were there with them in the story. We just know that when one of the group needed the others, they were there for him. And what is it that they did for him? And this gets at our second point. Meet people's expressed needs. Meet people's expressed needs. Let's look at verses 10 and 11. So Jesus said to the man, I tell you, get up, take up your mat and go home. He got up, took his mat and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone. And they praised God saying, we have never seen anything like this. You know, one of the reasons why a lot of people are uninterested or even hostile to Christians, I think it's because Christians keep trying to talk them about needs that they aren't expressing. In college, my Christian club that I was part of trained us to walk up to college students we didn't know and to say to them, if you were to die today, do you know you'd go to heaven? And did you know that we are all sinners and the wages of sin is death? And even, are you happy? This is to complete strangers. I, I, how could we ever expect them to have heartfelt open responses to questions like that when death and heaven and sin and wages of the sin, those aren't needs they were feeling at the time. We had walked up to them with our agenda and tried to engage them in that conversation. It may have worked when I was in college, but today we're better off meeting people's expressed needs. And there are plenty in 
in our own groups, in our community, in our city. Right now, express needs. People need justice. People need peace. People need health. People need fairness and equity. And some people need jobs. Some people in our community need food and shelter. Others need babysitting or dog walking. And young adults in particular need friends. There are a lot of express needs. We would do well to meet people's expressed needs. But I need to go back. I'm guessing some of you are saying, I skipped something and it's something important and confusing. I didn't forget. The paralyzed man's expressed need, his physical healing, wasn't the first thing Jesus offered to heal. Let's read it again. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Doesn't that seem odd and confusing? He came to be healed physically, and instead Jesus forgives his sin. I want to say, if I'm honest, and I'm that paralyzed man, and Jesus says my sins are forgiven, I'm thinking, really? Hello? Paralyzed? I think if we're being honest, we don't think forgiveness of sin is as important as physical healing. Forgiveness to us, it's not such a big deal. I mean, Christians, as Christians, we're taught to confess our sin and he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Absolutely. But you know, we do that at home, at night, in bed, before we go to sleep. I don't need to be drugged to someone's house and shoved down a hole in the roof to be forgiven for sins. I think we would be disappointed. But that's because we see things differently than Jesus did. Which leads to our third point. Let Jesus meet their deeper needs. Let Jesus meet their deeper needs. Having sins forgiven was a big deal back then. Jesus said, Son, your sins are forgiven. The connection between God and human beings and keeping that connection clear and clean was really important to them. We know that back then they had hundreds of traditions and laws and rules just to keep that connection clear, holy. And they had animal sacrifices to take care of it when, when that uh, relationship was broken. They understood there was a connection between sin and suffering. For Jesus and those religious teachers and even all those people in the room, theologically, they all understood that all diseases, all sorrow, all suffering, all of it is the result of sin, sin in the world. And to be able to deal with the symptom, this man's paralysis, meant that Jesus could deal with the cause, which was sin. That was something the religious leaders didn't want to hear about. But we can see it in some things that we see today. Consider this uh, example. Imagine that we have a headache so bad that we can't even see and that we, we, we lose our balance. And so we go to the doctor and we get an MRI and we have some other tests done. And the doctor says to us, hey, I can take care of that brain tumor. And we say, brain tumor? I, I came to see you about a headache. He said, yeah, well, uh, the headache is a symptom. The brain tumor is the cause. Brain tumor, headache. Sin, paralysis. It, it, not quite as directly related, but there is this sense theologically and spiritually that, uh, that the fallenness that we experience in the world comes from sin originally. Most of us have expressed needs from time to time, but all of us have deeper needs. Everyone in our group, everyone we meet, has deeper needs, needs that they don't always share, frankly, needs that they're not always aware of. Sometimes our deeper needs have been so normalized, we don't even realize that we have them. It's hard to believe, but sometimes our deeper issues can be more, uh, others can be more aware of them than we are. Carolyn worked with a delightful coworker, and 
uh, this person got into an argument with their supervisor and started yelling at the top of her lungs. Well, the supervisor calmed her down and calmed the situation down, but later Carolyn said to her, why were you yelling? And her coworker looked at her quizzically and, and said, when? She literally did not understand, did not realize she was yelling. She hadn't heard herself. And Carolyn could address the uh, express need of working better with a supervisor, but she wasn't going to touch whatever that deeper need might be. All of us, and each person in our group, and everyone we know, has deeper needs, and Jesus can meet those needs. Is it our job to point them out? To point out their need, their sin? Well, those friends didn't have to point out to the paralyzed man that he was paralyzed. It gets so complicated. Aggressive Christians today say it's loving to point out people's sins, people's deeper needs and problems. In fact, they use really hurtful tactics to do so. There's a real sense among some Christians that the end justifies uh, that, the, that the end justifies the means, that anything goes as long as we're moving the ball forward for God's kingdom. But I just want to say, back in chapter 1, I didn't hear Jesus say, I need your help to establish God's kingdom. He said the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's already here. It shouldn't be so complicated. And it was pretty simple for those friends when their friend had a need. And it's our fourth point. Bring people to Jesus. That's all they did. They brought their friends to Jesus. They brought their friend to Jesus, and he came willingly. They didn't need to trick him or shout at him or point out his problems. In our text today, there are friends who brought a friend to Jesus. Uh, there are also the religious teachers who were so caught up in their own issues that they can't offer that person grace, when he's lying right there in front of them. Who would we rather be with? The friends or the religious teachers? Who would we rather be? Let's be people who bring people to Jesus. All of which leaves us with a question that comes from a shocking statement Jesus made. It's so briefly mentioned that maybe you missed it. And if you caught it, maybe you thought I missed it. No, I didn't. I read it, and it raises a question every time I read it, and frankly, I think I need to read it more often. It's this in Mark 2, verse 5. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Their faith, their faith led to someone else's forgiveness and the meeting of someone else's need. Jesus didn't say it was the paralyzed man's faith. It was his friend's faith, which poses this question for us. Whose need has Jesus met because of our faith? Whose need has Jesus met because of our faith? We all have friends and loved ones with deep needs, challenging situations, and if we're honest, even sinful behaviors that we would intensely like to see them set free from. Do we have enough faith? to graciously bring them to Jesus. Maybe it means helping meet some of their expressed needs. I think Jesus saw the faith of those friends in their actions and in their faces as they looked down expectantly. He saw it in their willingness to look foolish if this didn't all work out. These are friends who brought their friend to a house where Jesus was. Our faith isn't just about what we need or want. Our faith isn't best lived out when we're sitting in church listening in a situation like this. Our faith may very well be best experienced by us and most healing to others when we are part of this. Our conversation now socially distanced. Or maybe even in our homes like this. As opportunities like home worship open up, I hope you will look for a group and look for ways to bring people to Jesus even when you can't bring them to church. Amen.
worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Oh, we live for you.
joining us for online worship. And in the words of Jesus, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey every command I have given you. So go, people of God, in the power of his presence to fulfill the purpose that he has called and sent you out to do. Go in peace. Mm -hmm.